Let me know when it's. Hello and uh, welcome to the Grad Alting workshop series. My name is Debbie McCutsky and I'm the coordinator of services and programs for graduate student legal aid. I use she, her pronouns. Um, this workshop is brought to you by Graduate Student Legal Aid, and we are pleased to present the topic of car buying and car care. Um, so in addition to the Grad Alting workshop series, um, Legal Aid provides other important services. Of course, legal consultations um, for general issues such as tenant landlord disputes, auto accidents, contract re reviews, and much, much more. Um, we also have a specialty in that we have legal consultations provided by an immigration attorney. Those happen once a month. Um, we provide advocacy for students who are charged mm -hmm. by the Office of Student Conduct with a violation of the Code of Conduct or the Code of Academic Integrity. <laughs> And I am a notary, so I will notarize things, whether it's um, school related or not. And all of our services are free. Um, we are offering consultations um, remotely, uh, except everything is remote except for notary services. So if you're interested in who we are and what we do, um, visit our website. Uh, we'll go ahead and share that link in the chat. So before we get started with the workshop, I have a few notes to share with you. Um, automatic closed captioning has been enabled for those who like to read along. Uh, and of course, we welcome your questions and your comments. So post them in the chat, direct them to everyone, not just to me or to our speakers. And we'll take questions um, throughout the workshop, but I know the speakers will make time um, at the end of their presentations for questions. Uh, near the end of the workshop, we will post a link to a six second survey. And it only has four questions. So it really does just take six seconds. So please answer those questions as best you can. And finally, after the workshop, uh, we will email all the, register all the registrants, um, the links to, uh, the survey, the slides, the recording, and any other important tidbits that come up during the workshop. So let's get started with the topic of the day, cars. I am pleased to introduce not just one, but two speakers who are really experienced investigators with the Montgomery County Consumer Protection Office. Um, they handle individual consumer complaints and participate in consumer education and outreach activities um, such as this. So first I'd like to welcome Sharon Mar Margolis. Um, she is a member of the Maryland Bar and she has worked for the Consumer Protection Office for the past 27 years. Um, and she's been a speaker in our workshop series since 2017. Second, I'd like to welcome Bernardo Vega. Mr. Vega received his BA from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and he has worked in the Consumer Protection Office for the past 15 years. We are so lucky to have two very, very experienced educators and investigators with us today. So Ms. Margolis, please start us off with the car buying process. Thank you. So as uh, Debbie mentioned, we are with the Montgomery County Office of Consumer Protection. We do handle disputes between merchants and consumers and um, can provide consumer specialists by phone or in person. We enforce Montgomery County's consumer protection laws. Now, um, in order for our office to have jurisdiction, normally the transaction has to have occurred in Montgomery County. Um, now I understand not uh, most of you may not may or may not be located in Montgomery County. If um, if the if you are having a problem, a consumer issue, and um, the transaction did not occur in Montgomery County, but it did occur in the state of Maryland, the Attorney General's office does have a consumer protection division that would handle those complaints. 
Um, we do also do education and outreach to the community like we're doing now, and we do license and regulate certain businesses. So the first and most important thing when you're buying a car is to make sure that you do your research. You need to know all about the cars that you are looking at before you go shopping. You, there's so much information out there these days. You can find prices and costs and features and reliability ratings just about anywhere. Um, and you, you should never leave it up to a seller to tell you what you need to know. So you're, the first thing you're going to do, of course, is choose where you're going to look for a vehicle. There's two different ways you can buy vehicles these days, either through a dealer or through a private individual, or those are the two main ways anyway. Um, when you uh, consider buying through a dealer, um, you know, dealers are required to be licensed with the Motor Vehicle Administration. So you're able to check for complaints against um, dealers with consumer protection offices, such as our office or the Attorney General's office and the Motor Vehicle Administration. Um, dealers also generally will provide warranties, uh, and, and dealers are required to put cars through safety inspections. When you buy from a private individual, the car may cost less, but um, you know, you, there is less regulatory oversight, and there's always the possibility that the individual is actually an unlicensed car dealer, what we call a, carbs, a curb stoner masquerading as the private owner of a vehicle, and that can be uh, dangerous as well. Um, another thing to be uh, cognizant of if you're purchasing from a private individual, don't pay using payment apps. You don't Venmo somebody that you don't know, um, as the payment, of course, can be difficult to trace if there's a problem with the car later. So inspecting vehicles is really important, especially for used cars, but with uh, new cars as well. Used cars should be inspected by a mechanic and a body shop. If a dealer or an individual doesn't allow you to take a vehicle to be inspected to a mechanic or a body shop, that's a red flag that that's probably not somebody you wanna be doing business with. Um, you may have heard about certified used cars. Um, those are cars that, you know, that there may be different kinds of sort of, there's certified cars that are certified by the manufacturer and there's certified cars that are certified by a dealer. You have to be just as careful with these kinds of programs. While you may have a warranty, it doesn't mean that the cars um, may not have been in an accident or there could have been some other kind of damage to them. Most used vehicles are required by Maryland law to undergo a safety inspection prior to transfer, but a safety inspection is very minimal. Um, it, it, it's not going to catch a lot of things that you would um, that that would be found by a mechanic or a body shop in in a more broad inspection. Um, generally, the seller of the vehicle is required to obtain the inspection certificate. But in a private party transaction, the seller or the buyer can obtain the inspection certificate. Um, if it's done electronically, then um, that's the uh, inspection certificate is submitted to the MVA in order to uh, register the vehicle. So if you have a particular vehicle in mind, or if you, um, when you're talking about a used vehicle, you, you wanna find out as much as you can about the vehicle's history. You may have heard about Carfax, and that is a good resource, but you have to be aware that it's not always accurate. It is you know, completely reliant on the information being provided to them. So uh, you, know, you always wanna make sure you ask the seller questions. Has the car been in an accident? Where did the car come from? ask for repair and maintenance records. And any representations that are made to you, you wanna make sure you get those representations in writing. It is very difficult to prove after the fact that somebody told you that the vehicle has not been in an accident. If that is an important thing, to, an important issue for you, you ask the question and you get, it, you get the answer in writing. So when it, once you have a vehicle, and you're deciding um, you know, whether or not you can afford the vehicle, you wanna negotiate a selling price before you discuss any kind of financing. 
you can, as, as I've noted before, you can research prices online. There are websites that have pricing information. I've listed some here, cars.com, nada.com, kbb.com. A big mistake is negotiating based on monthly payment. You never tell a car dealer what you can afford because that's what they'll sell you. They'll sell you a car at whatever you say you can afford. If you are not comfortable with the process of negotiating, I personally am not, um, there are buying services out there. There's one called Car Bargains, another called Authority Auto. Those services will negotiate for you and um, they will provide you with prices from car dealerships. Um, car Bargains, for example, will, um, will go to different dealerships and, and solicit prices from them and then provide you with printouts of, of pricing from several different dealerships in your area. And then you, cho you can choose which dealership you wanna do business with. Some companies also offer their own um, pricing programs, but your, your biggest uh, leverage is your feet. Just don't be afraid to walk away. If you're not happy with um, the, the deal that a, that a dealer is giving you, or if a dealer is not willing to negotiate with you, just walk away. You'd be surprised uh, how much power you really have in a negotiating situation. Sharon, mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Um, approximately how much does it is the charge for one of those car buying services? Um, car bargains, I believe, is around $300 and maybe a little more now. Um, and, but, but what I will say is that they offer a money back guarantee. So if you were able to find a, if you were able to get a price that was better than what they got for you, they will refund your money. I have to, I have to tell you that um, I anecdotally, I've, um, I, I did know someone who, who did pay for a car bargains report and thought that, uh, you know, there was no way they were able to do better than they were. And they went and tried to negotiate themselves. And of course, we're not able to get a better deal. Car bargains did give them the best deal, to, or at least a better deal than they could get themselves. Um, so, you know, it, it really um, is a question of what is your time worth? Um, if, uh, if you don't want to be spending the time to do all the research and all of that yourself, or be in a dealership and haggling with a salesperson yourself, um, you just have to decide how much your time is worth. So once you have negotiated a price, um, you know that you do have many different options when it comes to financing. You are not limited to what the dealer offers. There are banks and credit unions who can finance vehicles as well. And this is another area in which you need to do your research before you go shopping. Um, you know, if, if you come to the dealership with money in hand, obviously that, um, that, that will assist you in, in making the process go quicker. But you don't necessarily have to tell the dealership that when you come, when, you know, at when you're doing your negotiating. Just keep it in your back pocket. And once you negotiate your price, then when they try to start uh, pushing financing, you can just say, no, I already have, have, my, have my financing and then um, go from there. Now, if you are going to do dealer financing, there is something called spot delivery. This is a situation where um, the dealer financing may actually not be final when you take delivery of the vehicle. This can happen in a situation where, um, you know, maybe it's Sunday night. Obviously the banks are not open on Sunday night. Um, so the dealer is not going to be getting the money or an answer from the bank right away. It's always possible that once the bank reviews the information that they may decide they need something else or um, they're not comfortable with the financing. Um, but there are required disclosures, at least in the state of Maryland, um, there are certain disclosures that are required to be made by law. There's a um, special form which must be presented to you, which explains your rights and must be signed by you. Um, if and if financing can't be finalized, 
and then you do have the right to bring the car back. You are not required to sign another contract. Um, so, in uh, you know, in, that was in talking about financing. You, you generally think about two different ways of doing it: buying and leasing. You know, purchasing is a straight loan. Um, leasing is uh, a, a, a different method of financing. Um, there are pros and cons to both, and depending on your particular situation, one may be better for you than the other. You know, some of the the um, trade-offs are, are here on this slide. In terms of ownership, obviously when you purchase the vehicle or you use a loan to finance the vehicle, you own the vehicle and you can keep it as long as you want and change the car, do whatever you want to it. In leasing, you don't own the vehicle. You have to return it at the end of the lease unless you decide to buy it. And of course, any modifications could, uh, could, be co could cost you when, you when you return the vehicle. The upfront cost of buying um, generally going to be higher than leasing. You may um, have to, to put, um, put down a bigger down payment. Um, you may have to cover the taxes. Uh, with leasing, the down payment may be lower, um, but there are fees, upfront fees that do need to be paid. The monthly payments for, for purchasing or for getting a loan are usually going to be higher than leasing because you have to pay off the entire purchase price of the vehicle. With leasing, you're only paying for the vehicle for the, the amount of time that you have it during the lease term. So payments are going to be lower, which is one of the big reasons why people tend to look at leasing as an option. Um, you can get a better car for less money. Now, whether that's always a good idea, that's up to you. Um, Early termination is also an issue with leasing. With Not with buying, you can sell or trade your vehicle at any time. If you have an issue in a lease and you need to get out of it early, there can be really high fees. Um, that is the same with the return. Again, you, need to, uh, you can sell or trade your vehicle at any time if you want a different one. Um, now with leasing, as long as you make it to the end of the lease term, if, you can, um, if, if you want another vehicle, if you want to get rid of the vehicle, you can return the vehicle at least and then walk away. Of course, if you buy it, you'll have to pay off your loan. So if, if you know that you only want to use a car for a certain number of years, leasing may be a, a good option for you. Um, in terms of the future, va future value of the vehicle, when you own the car, you have equity once you've paid it off. Uh, leasing, of course, you never have any equity. Um, with mileage, that can be an issue with leasing. When you own the car, you can drive the, the vehicle as many as long and as far as you want. It could, event, it could affect the value of the vehicle at, at, at the end if you want to sell it, um, but you're not penalized. Um, if you're leasing the car, you have to be very cognizant of the number of miles that the lease allows you to drive. If you, because if you do drive the vehicle for more miles than what's allowed in the lease, you're going to, um, going to have extra costs at the end. Excess wear and tear can be an issue as well. Obviously, if you own the vehicle, although it can affect the value of the vehicle, you are not going to be penalized for it. But if, if you have excess wear and tear to a leased vehicle, when you turn in the vehicle, you could be charged. Um, for, in terms of the end of the term, when you finish your loan, you've got a car that you can still use and you free and clear without making payments. That's one of the biggest benefits of uh, purchasing a vehicle and paying off the loan. That will never happen with a lease. When, you, when the, the term ends, you have to turn in the vehicle. And in order to get another vehicle, you will have, have to enter either into a new loan or a new lease and you will still have payments. Um, but if you're someone who likes to get a new car every few years, um, you know, that, that could be the option for you. And of course, with repairs, um, you know, you, when you uh, purchase the vehicle, you do have a warranty for the initial time period of the vehicle. But once the warranty expires, you're responsible for the repairs. One of the benefits of leasing is that usually you only have the vehicle during the time that it is covered by warranty. So repairs may not uh, be as much of an issue. 
the biggest thing in when you are dealing with purchasing a vehicle is to make sure that you read every document very carefully. You do not sign something that you don't understand. There is no three day right to cancel a car contract. I can't emphasize that more. I know a lot of people think that that is something that exists. It does not. There is no three day right to cancel a car contract. Once you have signed that contract, the car is yours. And I don't know if anyone's been to a car dealership recently, but um, more and more um, we're finding electronic contracting going on, e-contracting. So you're signing forms on tablets or in some other digital form. It's very hard sometimes to see all of the terms that way. Tell them you want a printed copy. They should be able to do that for you. But at the very least, make sure you read everything that you get and make sure you understand everything that you're signing. And if you don't, don't sign it. That's it's the most important thing I can say. Do not sign something that you don't understand. So that is it for the for my slides. Um, you know, there are if anybody has any specific questions, I, I can answer them now. Oh. No? Okay. Oh. And I don't know, um, I talked a little bit about it beforehand. Um, and I, there was a something, uh, a question that had been submitted beforehand. And I don't know if anyone is interested or not, but the difference between buying a new car and a used car. Um, if anybody does want more information about that, I, I, I can talk about that later. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so you said not to transact over uh, payment apps, but isn't cash even less traceable and there's no record of the transaction? Well, as, as long as you have a contract in writing and a receipt that you paid, then that, that doesn't become an issue. What we find a lot of times with, with the paying by payment apps is that you have nothing in writing to, um, to, 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 to verify any payments or what you've, or what you've done. And, and in that situation also, you may never actually have met the person face-to-face. -face. When you're paying by cash, you're actually meeting that person face-to-face. -face. Doing something completely online and then Venmoing the money, it, it, it's just a recipe for disaster. Okay, yeah, thank you. I, I was thinking more about like private party negotiate, like something on like Craigslist or something where you met the person, yeah, but I, I see your point for sure, thank you. Okay, Bernie. All righty. So recalls, recalls are uh, handled by NHTSA. They're voluntary. Uh, they get their authority from the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act, came out in 1966. Long and short of it, what is it? <clears throat> that when vehicles don't meet federal safety standards, NHTSA puts out bulletins and allows them an opportunity to make corrections, recalls, repairs, all for free. How does that happen? Uh, when something is discovered, Car owners complain, manufacturers complain, NHTSA gets involved, and there's remedy. If we recently recall the Takata incident with the airbags, that was via NHTSA. Uh, so say you have a GM product that has a certain kind of airbag, now you can get it repaired, you can get it fixed, no cost to you. The manufacturers are required to notify the owners of the vehicles uh, and make all remedies as possible. In a nutshell, there's about 390 million vehicles since this came out that have been affected and have gotten remedy through it. Uh, so it is voluntary. It is an opportunity for manufacturers to, to correct defects that don't meet safety standards. Uh, so if there's an issue, you always want to report it. The more you report, it gets on the radar. Okay, next slide. Okay, so where do you find the recalls? It's uh, recalls.gov, safecar.gov, and nitsa.gov backslash safecar app. What do you need? Your year, your make, your model, your VIN. 
So what's a VIN, right? Where do you find a VIN? What's a VIN? A VIN is usually going to be found in the lower left-hand corner of the vehicle or on the door jam. It's going to have the weight, where it was manufactured, specifics to that vehicle, okay? Motor size and everything of the sort. Uh, tire size, all the good information that you would need in order to identify your car. That's basically what the car's social security is. Next slide. Okay, so maintaining your vehicle. You need to, oh, one second, can I move that? There we go. So maintaining your vehicle. You always want to read your warranty, your owner's manual first, okay? It's, it's a rather thick document, but you always want to go through your owner's manual that's going to give you your regular maintenance, tell you how to keep up with the car, what you need to do, when you need to do it, and it's going to avoid a lot of headaches in the long run. And so that's why it's so important in every level of car maintenance, regardless of whether you have a gasoline, a diesel, a hybrid, or electric, you always, first thing you do when you want to get a car is you, or you get a car is you always want to read the owner's manual. I touched on the three types of, or the multiple types of, of, oh, we got ahead of ourselves, types of vehicles. We have gasoline, diesel, hybrid, and electric. So let's start out with gasoline. It's the most basic and simplest. Again, read your owner's manual first thin. It's going to tell you exactly what kind of oil, what weight. Uh, it's going to have the times in which you need to, to give it the regular service and how frequent. Okay, If you give your car too much attention, that's never going to be a problem. If you've never heard of a garage or a dealer saying, sir, ma'am, you're changing your oil far too much. You're taking care of your car far too much. No. You can't overdo it with maintenance, okay? Another good tip would be your oil filters. You need to use good quality oil filters because in a while, a few cases I've had, the oil filter subpar comes flying off. Your engine has a catastrophic failure. So what you want to do is go for good oil filters like Fram, uh, Purelator, known reputable manufacturers. So in changing this, what changing your oil and doing the upkeep, what are some things that might give you a hint that there's something off? If when you park your car, you start seeing oil leaks, uh, you start noticing the oil gauge go down a little bit, you probably wanna to top it off. You probably wanna take the car into the garage and have it checked out, okay? Yes, some cars burn a bit of oil. Yes, some leakage is normal, but you still wanna stay on top of things. Next slide, please. The most basic, wiper blades, not too hard. Every six to 12 months, you wanna replace them to keep them working properly so they don't streak. You wanna rub them down with some rubbing alcohol. Not that bad. Uh, six to 12 months, depending on how you use them and where you live. Next slide, please. The battery. The most basic reason why you get stranded on the side of the road. You always wanna make sure that your terminals are fastened tightly. From time to time, you have corrosion. On the terminals, it's not that big a deal. You simply just use a little bit of baking soda and water, maybe some soda, small brush cleans it right up, but you wanna have those points of contacts as clean as possible because more times than not, that is an issue as to why you're not getting a good start. Next slide, please. Brakes, again, regular maintenance. Squeaks are perfectly fine. Scrapes, grinding, rattling, you want to take it in immediately to the shop because that's that's not normal. Uh, you want to check your pads and your rotors and your disc brakes at the recommended intervals that the manufacturer provides. With the braking system, you need to keep in mind that the fluid does break down, does absorb moisture. So you want to turn to your to your uh, owner's manual and see when the manufacturer's recommended changes when you need to swap out the the fluid it's usually every two years every thirty thousand miles for the most part next slide belts and hoses this is where you start having to get a little bit more in detail yes they're going to have some smaller cracks but if you start seeing larger cracks in the belts soft spots or leaks or swelling in the hoses that's going to be a problem you want to always check again your owner's manual. That's going to tell you exactly at what mileage, at what time interval to always change 
your, your hoses and your belts. More specifically, you're gonna to have to be very careful when dealing with your timing belt, because if your timing belt is off, your timing belt has any kind of issues to it, it can have a catastrophic failure that will cost you a motor. So instead of changing a timing belt, you're gonna go ahead and change out your motor because it threw the belt and now the entire top of the engine is destroyed. That happened to a lot of manufacturers in the late 90s, early 2000s, one specifically that had an interference motor. Next slide, please. Tires, you always want to check your tires in cold weather. Uh, why? Because as we know in the heat, the air expands, you're not gonna get a proper reading. You also always wanna inspect the tire for unusual, uh, unusual wear, cupping, uh, make sure that the little tabs are not showing. It's always best to use a penny. You always wanna make sure that uh, Lincoln's hat is not showing. Now, since about 07, 2007, most vehicles, most newer vehicles come out with a TPMS, uh, tire pressure monitoring system. It's a system that tells you you have a flat, you have a low, low pressure, and it's uh, more or less an indicator telling you something's going on, you need to give it attention pull over, go into your local garage and, and have it looked at. Next, uh, next slide. Tire placards. Again, this is uh, starting in 2003. They're all uniform. They all have the same location. They tell you exactly uh, what size tires you're running, what their weight capacity is, uh, what the original size of the tire is for the vehicle, as well as the uh, spare. On new vehicles, it's usually on what's called the B placard. If it's not on the B placard, it's gonna be on the rear edge of the door. Uh, if they don't have, either, if your vehicle doesn't have either of those three things, it's gonna be on the inside cabin facing inward <laughs> next to the driver's seat position. Alrighty, next slide, please. Hybrid vehicles, okay. Hybrid vehicles, you can get a bit of a, bit of a break on the costs because uh, you're not maintaining as much. You're going to get better gas mileage, lower wear and tear. It's going to last far longer and less out of pocket. Okay. Before when hybrids first came out, you had to take it back to the dealership because your mom and pop shops didn't have the specializations to deal with that. Now with platforms like all data and things of that, you can go just about anywhere. But before having your shot, your car worked on by independent, you want to make sure that one, they're familiar with it, with your make, model, and year, and that they have the credentials. They have all the licenses to work on hybrids. Next, license, uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay, so like any other vehicle, you still have maintenance, but you don't have as much. There, there is uh, a problem with hybrids or a specialization with hybrids that the battery packs, the battery packs tend to be the weak point. So manufacturers, in seeing that, they've given eight-year, 100,000 or 10-year, 150,000 uh, mile warranties on these battery packs. You're going to have less frequent uh, oil changes. You're going to have uh, them last up to 5,000 because of the, the, the hybrid feature. You're going always to want to refer to your owner's manual regardless because that's going to be the keystone as to when you take action when you perform maintenance, when you have to change things out. So always refer back to your owner's manual. Brakes obviously are gonna last a lot longer. Why? Because in hybrids and all electrical vehicles, they have what's called a regenerative braking system. There's less heat, less heat means less friction, less friction means less wear and tear on brake pads. Uh, again, as I touch base, brake pads do, do last longer, uh, typically last up to a year or longer. Next slide, please. So you do have to be conscious for safety when dealing with hybrid vehicles, okay? Um, you never want to jumpstart a hybrid just because you're dealing with, with a vehicle that has two systems of, uh, two electrical systems, AC, DC, as well as high voltage. If you're in a crash, you wanna be very careful as to what you touch and what you don't touch because unfortunately with the secondary system, if you touch something, you can cause serious bodily harm to yourself or even further, okay? Uh, you always wanna to read the, the manufacturer's warranties, their guidance, 
their, their warnings. If anything's bright orange, I highly recommend you don't touch anything that's brightly colored, especially on a hybrid or electrical vehicle. Uh, you will have a very bad day. Uh, next slide, please. EVs, electric vehicles. All righty, so with that, we're dealing with few, fewer moving parts, reduction in fluids, the extended uh, brake wear because of the specialized braking system. Uh, now, the, the, the parts that do need service and do need special attention, they are specified in your owner's manual, more specifically the cooling system, okay? The two systems that you're going to need to check, which are is your cooling system and oddly enough, your, your brake fluids, okay? Uh, with the electrical vehicle, you're dealing with heat management. You're dealing with having to top it off from time to time. You have two main fluids in an electric vehicle. You're dealing with washer fluid and you're dealing with uh, brake fluid. Okay, again, you always want to check your brake fluid as per your owner's manual because brake fluid does, does break down and absorb moisture over time and it becomes an issue. Now, in electric vehicles, you do have the regenerative, regenerative braking process, which does use the own kinetic energy of the vehicle. It helps last longer and you're not gonna deal with the same issues as a traditional vehicle. You're not going to deal with oil. Uh, next slide, please. You, okay, yeah. So the battery, okay. The battery is, is a specialized point in this, and it is, again, the weak point. Uh, the manufacturers of electrical vehicles have taken this uh, into consideration and have provided 10-year warranties, 150,000, eight-year, or 100,000 things that you will never need an electrical vehicle, okay? Almost petroleum-based. You're not gonna deal with any oil changes, spark plugs, wires, fuel filters, anything with exhaust, anything that has to deal with combustion obviously is off the table. Therefore, in the long run, it may be beneficial the way we're going to start looking towards electrical vehicles. Next slide, please. So routine service at each step. You check your oil, you check as required, your windshield washer, solvent as required, you clean and, and wipe the blades whenever you're at a pit stop. Once a month, it's probably a good idea to check for wear and damages on your, on your tires, top off all fluids, power steering, transmission. You wanna check and clean your batteries every so often, probably once a month, check your lights, okay? Walk around the car, make sure that all your lights are functioning. Uh, your wiper blades, you want to make sure that every six to 12 months that they're not frayed, cracked, or anything that is needed. Service lubrication of your hinges and or friction points. Okay, next slide, please. So helpful web websites. Uh, NAGA guidelines, Kelly Blue Book, Edmonds, Consumer Report, Washington Consumer Checkbook, Yelp. Uh, and NICB, the National Insurance Crime and Bureau, Consumer World, and the Maryland Attorney General's Office for helpful tips, websites for anything dealing with automotive. Next slide. So here we have our information. If you happen to have a transaction here in Montgomery County, Maryland, we would be more than happy to help you. As my colleague said earlier, as long as the transaction happens here in Montgomery County, Maryland, we can take care of it. Any questions? I have a question regarding warranty. Yes, sir. Um, do car, so you get a warranty on a new car. Do, do they generally stipulate in the warranty that you do repairs and maintenance with a dealer? Um, like, are there cases where if you did it with like just a regular garage shop or something, they wouldn't uh, honor the warranty? So we're talking about a manufacturer's warranty and you want to go to an independent. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And then okay. say something later down the road. If, if you're dealing with a manufacturer's warranty, more times than not, a manufacturer's warranty, or you say you go to your local domestic car dealer and it's a warranty from that domestic manufacturer, more times than not, they're going to ask you to go to their dealership. Okay. 
Well, it depends on whether you're talking about maintenance or repairs. Correct. Are you talking about maintenance or are you talking about repairs? So I, I'm trying to say like, if, if you generally have your maintenance done like for a couple of years at like an independent garage and then something like really bad happens, like, you know, four years into uh, ownership of the vehicle, but it, it's covered on the manufacturer warranty, what would happen then? Would well, they have any as long, as long as you can provide documentation that you have been doing your maintenance as per the owner's manual, they can't hold that against you. They are not allowed to require that you do your maintenance at the dealership. Now they can require that any warranty repairs be done at the dealership. But in terms of just maintenance, no, you don't have to do that at the dealership, but you have to make sure that you are retaining all of your documentation so that, so that if it ever does become an issue that you have that to show them. Obviously, if you're having it done at the dealership, the dealership has all that information itself. And so it's, there, there's not as much of an onus on you to make sure that you've kept all that documentation. Um, but no, any regular maintenance does not have to be done at the dealer. You just have to make sure, though, that you are maintaining your documentation so that if it does come into play at some time down the road, that you will have all that, all the, all the documentation that it was done. Okay, perfect. Thank you. There you go. There's now, your... does that mean that the dealer, is that going to stop the dealer from saying that the other person did it wrong? Well, you know, <laughs> they may try to make that argument, but. I don't know that the, I, I don't know that that's successful too often. Uh, hi, I have a quick question. So um, due to the car shortage, some dealership asks to put a deposit. Is it a normal process? Well, the pandemic is making everything different. Um, you know, as, as you said, there is an auto shortage and it's influencing everything in terms of whether you can buy, even buy a new car or a used car. Um, prices are gonna be higher for both, unfortunately. Um, and there's a lot of competition right now because there's just not a lot of availability. Can, can a dealership you know, require, if, if they've got multiple people who, who wanna buy the same car, um, is it illegal for them to say that they wanna deposit? No, I don't. I, I don't know of any laws that that make that illegal. Um, as long as it's the same, you know, they're doing the same thing for everybody. It's a common practice. Um, I, I I don't think we can say that they can't do that. Okay, thank you. So when putting a deposit, they are going to give us a like a writing paper to verify that you are going to get a car, but maybe in a few months. Right. Well, and the, the thing with deposits, though, I will say this, it, it can't be non-refundable, all right? If, if they're saying that, that it's non-refundable, um, that actually would be in violation of Motor Vehicle Administration regulations. As long as you haven't taken delivery of the vehicle, if you are just putting a deposit and you, haven't, and you don't pay anything else, you haven't, um, you haven't signed a finance contract, and you have not um, given them any other money besides the deposit, you can still change your mind and you should be able to get your deposit back. If a, if a deal, dealership should not be saying that, that deposits are non-refundable, I don't know if that is coming up, um, but that, that, is, that is a no-no, um, except in very limited situations. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, the one. Else have a question. You have a question? Did someone say they had a question? No, I'm just. I was just asking for questions. Oh, is oh. It, the one okay. silver lining of uh, <clears throat> of the auto shortage. If you can actually get a car, you know, the the one knock on new cars is uh, you know the depreciation issue but um, you know because the market is so tight now uh, uh, cars are actually depreciating more slowly and um, actually the, you know depending on how much tighter it gets it's always possible that the value of your vehicle can go up from when you purchased it so that is the one silver lining but you know it is you're paying a lot more for the vehicle to begin with right now so I'm not sure how much of a silver lining it actually is 
So if you have um, a few minutes, um, could you cover a little bit about new versus used cars? Sure, sure. That'd be great. And I mean, I touched on it a little bit. You know, the, the advantages um, and disadvantages of new versus used. Obviously, depreciation and expense are, are the, the two big the two big things, you know, when you're buying a new car, uh, it's going to be more expensive and um, you're, you're paying for that depreciation. And as soon as you take it off, you've heard it, you've heard people say it, as soon as you take it off the lot, it immediately decreases in value. Um, that is, that is the case, but as I just noted, maybe not so much the case right now. And um, it, that also will vary depending on the vehicle itself. It, that is much more of an issue with uh, more expensive vehicles. But with new cars, um, it actually can be easier to finance a new car and financing for new cars is generally going to be cheaper. So, um, you know, advantages of the new car, of, of buying a new car, well, shopping is generally gonna be easier. There's, you know, um, it's, pretty more, it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of what you're looking for. You're just generally shopping on, on price and, and um, color and options. Um, there are more financing options. Um, you know, there may be dealer incentives, uh, cheaper financing. Newer cars will have more advanced technology. So things like the safety, um, connectivity, you know, Bluetooth and all of that. Uh, newer cars tend to be more fuel efficient as well. Um, and, and there's more peace of mind. You, you don't have an issue of wondering what the history of the vehicle is, um, and you are getting that factory warranty, which is going to be good for a couple of years. So um, there is that. And some values, you know, some brands do hold their value very well, so some depreciation won't be as much of an issue. Um, so when you add in, you know, new car incentives, low interest financing, there, there are times when buying new doesn't cost much more than buying used. But, um, you know, there, there are advantages to the used cars as well, you know, most notably the expense and the less depreciation. Um, your car insurance may be lower. Um, you can, you know, because the cars are less expensive, you can shop in a higher class. Um, you don't worry so much about, you know, the little dings on your car. Um, so, uh, you know, th those, are, those are all reasons why uh, used cars may be, you know, maybe more of what you're looking for. It's mostly going to be the expense because they are going to be cheaper. But uh, uh, that's very helpful. Yeah. And well, so, you know, if you're looking for something less expensive, the used <clears throat> car may be what you need, need to go with. But Again, when you take into account the other things like financing, insurance, and all of that, you know, there, there may be other costs that may swing it in one way or the other. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned insurance. Um, I will send out some information about auto insurance um, along with the survey, the slides, the link to the recording. So for those of you who are in the market, you will be fully educated on things you need to consider when you're buying a car. Are there any more questions for Ms. Margolis or Mr. Vega? All right, well, hearing none, um, <laughs> thank you so much for this very comprehensive um, view of what we need to be thinking about when we're buying a car um, and trying to take care of it. Um, you're, you, you both hit the nail on the head with a couple of things for me in particular. I really like that chart on buying versus leasing. Um, I've never leased a car, but I have thought about it, but that's one of the best charts I've ever seen. Um, I've also been thinking about buying a hybrid or an EV. And uh, so, Mr. Vega, that, that information was really helpful. Um, it, it dismissed some of the misconceptions that I had. So thank you both so much for your time today and for sharing your expertise. Um, I want to thank all the students who signed in on Zoom and those who are watching on YouTube.
Um, so we will wrap this up with a reminder about the six second survey. We will share that um, after the workshop. And um, also I'd like you to register for the workshop next week, which is help me understand my intellectual property rights. So in the meantime, have a great week and uh, let us know how we at Legal Aid can help you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.